Our Bible reading tonight comes from the book of Esther, chapter 4. If you're struggling to find Esther, go to Psalms in the middle, go back two books and you'll be there. So chapter 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay him into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the, the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show Esther and explain it to her, and he told him to urge her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for the, a man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the, royal, the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. This is God's word. Well, it's great to uh, open God's word now and to hear him speak. Uh, please keep the passage open uh, so that we can work through it together, everyone can see it, and uh, that we can get the riches from it that the Lord has. As we consider this chapter, it just reminded me of the thought that each one of us, whatever our beliefs, religious or not, have a sense of destiny within us, that there is something ahead, and we want to ask the question, where are we heading, both short-term and long-term? And there is a sense that we feel our destiny or what is ahead for us will be determined by the choices that we make in the here and now or even the day that we find ourselves in. And so when we get to these points or these paths and we reach a crossroads moment and we think, depending on how I act here and depending on what I stand for and what choice I make will determine, I guess, my destiny. Now, the thought of our destiny and where we are heading can fill us with fear because we arrive at certain points and we're face to face with something that we didn't expect that actually wasn't part of our plan for our lives, something that we feel like we weren't prepared for. Or 
The thought of destiny and circumstances can actually fill us with courage and hope because as we look at the situation, we get a sense of there's a purpose at work here and we step into it and we move forward and the pivotal moment we face head on. It's interesting that our passage tonight deals with just that and here in our text, we are faced with a date with destiny. So you've been sitting for a while, so I'm going to pray and I invite you to join with me. You can stand and let's ask the Lord uh, to bless this time of his word. Father, we thank you that we have heard your word read uh, now. And Lord, we pray that you would, by your power, give us ears to hear what you would have us here tonight. Lord, what you're wanting to say and what you're wanting to communicate to us, help us to hear it. And God, as it goes in the ears, may it move from the mind to the heart. And we pray that you would give us responsive hearts. And Lord, work on our eyes as well, that they might not be dull and that they might not be looking to the left or the right. May you deal with each of us individually and corporately as those who've gathered here tonight to meet with you. And Lord, we pray this and we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, if you are taking notes uh, or if you're just following along, our first point uh, this evening is a fearful people. We see a fearful people. Look at the opening words that the chapter begins with. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done. Now, this is the author directing us back to chapter 3 here. This is Haman, the second most powerful person in the empire, has deceived and manipulated the king into completely wiping out all the Jews in the Persian Empire. He's deceived the king and the king's agreed to it. Now, this has just happened. Mordecai hears of this. Now, what's his response? What does Mordecai do? Look at verses 1 and 2. Mordecai learned of all that had happened. He tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and ashes and he went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. Now, there is graphic pain that is on display there. But out of all the Jews, we can imagine that Mordecai's pain would have been the greatest. Now, why is that? Because what had started out between a little personal decision that he made to not bow to Haman, he didn't want to do that. And that little personal thing that he had with Haman now affected all of the Jews. So the whole would be affected because of the decision of the one and at this point, it's estimated that there are some 15 million Jews throughout the Persian Empire at this time. Imagine the guilt, perhaps, that Mordecai felt at this time, the blood of men, women, children on his hands because he refused to bow to Haman. Now, we mustn't, mustn't rush into judgment of Mordecai here. Perhaps he was bound to his conscience. And as a Jew, he couldn't bow to Haman. Perhaps that was what was going on. Nevertheless, the Jews will be punished because of his sake and his interaction with Haman. Now, in utter distress, it says he tears his clothes that were on his body and he puts on sackcloth. Now, this is a rough material, a black material that would have been made from goat's hair and it was very, very uncomfortable. So he puts on sackcloth and it says he puts on ashes. Well, we're all familiar with that, the remains of a fire. And the ashes are supposed to symbolize ruin, destruction, misery, and he pours it upon himself with these clothing. I remember, as I was looking at this and just the imagery of uh, Mordecai, I remember being a kid and I was at my grandma's house. She didn't have many toys. And so to pass the time, she put on a home a, a video of when we were little babies and when we were kids. And I was watching the home video and there was people in it, and we, the kids, were sitting on the lounge, and a family friend of my grandma walked into the room. And I noticed that she was completely different to everyone else. She was dressed in black from head to toe, from what she was wearing on her head, a little veil, black clothes, black pants, black shoes, completely black. And I remember as a kid turning to my grandma watching this, I said, 
why, why is she dressed like that for? Why is she wearing that in the house? And my grandma, I remember my grandma saying to me just a couple of weeks ago, her husband died and made her a widow, and he was very young. And for her, the funeral had passed, but she wanted to communicate that she was still in grief. She was in misery. So despite what everyone else was going through, she was in misery. The external sign that she had upon her was communicating the inward grief. So that black kind of outfit is the modern equivalent of sackcloth and ashes. The mourning and the grief. But Mordecai's grief is greater still because you notice what it says. He went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. Now, this is Mordecai with no mask on now, com completely off. He's not hiding his Jewish identity anymore. And he is publicly identifying with his brothers and sisters who are Jews who've been sentenced to the slaughterhouse, into the public square, weeping and wailing. It's not long before the news reaches the entire Persian Empire. Look at verse 3. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. The posture is the same for the rest of the Jewish community. Weeping, wailing, the, these Jews are fasting, and they're laying in sackcloth and ashes. So much grief that they de deny themselves the comforts of food. They fast. And so much grief, they deny themselves the comforts of fine clothing and their beds, and they lay in sackcloth and ashes. And as we consider this, this evil edict that Pastor Ian had dealt with last week, it's seemingly out of nowhere. This mass extermination, this holocaust, is just out of nowhere, it seems like. And this would have been a massive shock to the Jews. But this is where the context is crucial. Remember what we spent weeks looking at. Israel's context, they're originally conquered by Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar and removed from their land. And then Babylon was beaten by the Medo-Persians under Cyrus. And then Cyrus tells these exiled Jew Jews, you can go back to your land. You can go back to Israel. And I'll even, ref I'll even fund the rebuilding of the temple so that you can worship again. And many of the Jews returned. But so many of them stayed in the foreign land. So what God had designed originally to only be a temporal punishment and temporal discipline for their sin, many of the Jews turned it into a permanent stay. They'd built up a life there. They'd earned a living. They'd started raising their families there. You see, they had forgotten who they were. They'd forgotten that they were originally the chosen out people. They forgot the covenant God made with Abraham. They forgot the covenant God made with Moses to Israel at Sinai and that that land would be a holy land for them. They forgot that they were supposed to be a light. They were a city on a hill, but they were no longer a light to the Gentiles. They were barely a candle flickering because they were scattered now. And the point is, they were what they were, and the situation was what it was because they were comfortable under a pagan king. They felt secure under his dominion, but the new edict of this mass extermination, it proved that they had a false sense of security. They weren't safe. What have we seen repeatedly through the book of Esther? What keeps coming up? Life in the kingdom of darkness is not all that it promises. They were comfortable, and they were no longer even really looking forward to the Messiah. How do we know that? Because they wouldn't return to Zion. Zion was where the Messiah was supposed to come. That's where he was going to reign from, and they don't even go back there. He hasn't arrived yet. And so what does God do to his people? What does he do? He allows this evil edict to pass. He allows it to pass, and he reminds them that the kings of the earth are not safe. And all that they promise is not what you think. They do not give life. They do not give hope. They cannot impasse peace. They are false messiahs. They can't do it. And so to wake them up, God breaks his people. He breaks them down. And he strikes fear 
into the core of their bones. And he brings them to weeping, wailing, fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And they are terrified. This is a fearful people. Secondly, tonight we see a fearful leader. A fearful leader. Now, Esther is woven back into the events that are unfolding. Look at verses 4 to 6. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to go find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Now Esther hears that something is seriously wrong with Mordecai. He's in sackcloth ashes, he's weeping, wailing in the city. And so what does Esther do? She sends him some nice clothes to get changed into, to get him out of the sackcloth and ashes. He was making a massive spectacle of himself. And after all, it's not a good look for the relative of a queen to be out in the city like that if anyone found out of their relationship. But instead of finding out why Mordecai is so distraught, she seeks to just give him some clothes to get him out of that situation. And what does Mordecai do? He returns him straight to the sender. I don't want those. I don't want those. It's not a new outfit I'm after. And it's only then that Esther realizes, okay, maybe I should ask him what's actually going on. Now, this is the astounding part. As we look at her, get to the point where she says, Mordecai, what's wrong? It's astounding because we find out just how in the dark Esther is about this entire situation. She's completely oblivious. Look how isolated she is from the rest of God's people. She's got no idea. In verse 1, Mordecai is in absolute distress. In verse 3, all of Israel throughout the empire is in absolute distress. In verses 4 and 5, Esther has got no idea what's going on. Absolutely none. So Israel are in ashes, wearing ashes, and she is blissfully ignorant in the palace walls. Let me read an uncomfortable quote by one writer. He says this, quote, She was apparently the only person in the whole Persian Empire who had not heard the news. Perhaps she didn't have time between her manicures, pedicures, and other beauty treatments to keep up with the local coffee socializing about the fortunes of her own people. Now, how could she be so cut off from the news about her people? Remember what happened in the other chapters? Let me continue the quote. Since she had done such a good job of concealing her identity, why would anyone think to inform her of the threat to this particular people? End quote. She is so far removed from her people. Now, she may be living in luxury, but understand this, the palace now is functioning almost as her prison. It's where she lives. Those four walls. And that's where she is. And she's unaware of the plight that her people face, and so she sends her servant Hathak to talk to Mordecai. Now, Mordecai speaks to the messenger, Hathak. He's the messenger in between here. And in verses 6 to 8, we won't read of it, but Mordecai passes on the entirety of the news, of everything that's happened. He he tells Esther about Haman's plan, and he even, he goes so far to say that Haman's, you know, put his own money into this project. He's going to fund it. And By the way, this edict has been sealed by your husband, the king. It was just a couple of months ago that we were all looking at the news and we're watching on prior to the war of Russia and Ukraine and the news and the media, media, all the speculation that was going on. You know, will this be prevented through negotiations Is Putin just bluffing, flexing his muscles, or is he actually serious? Could we really see a World War III come out of this? All of it's speculation. What we get here is Mordecai saying, this is happening. And it's being funded by an ancient Judas, a proto-Hitler, and things are underway. And it has been sealed by the most powerful man on the planet, your husband, the king. This is happening now. This is where we are. 
And so Mordecai pleads with Esther, pleads with her as the queen. And look what verse 8, the end of verse 8, he tells Hazak to pass on to Esther to urge her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Go to the king, beg for mercy, and plead for your people. Plead for them. Now, do you see here the dual citizenship, the dilemma that Esther finds herself in? We've been talking about this for weeks now. Do you see the predicament that she's in? Dual citizenship. Go into the king's presence. She is the king's queen. That's her family now. The palace is now her home. And the Persian Empire is her life. Go to the king where you live. Go to your husband. But notice the second half of the statement. And plead for your people. She may have a crown. She may be married to the king. She may live in a palace. But the blood of the covenant people runs through her veins. The Jews are in need of her. And so here's the dilemma. Go to your family, the king, and plead for your people, the Jews, whom your husband is going to kill. World's colliding. So which family will she side with? Esther knows the right choice, but the right choice seems impossible. So look what she says in verses 9 to 11. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he should be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Everyone in the palace and everyone in the royal courts throughout the provinces knew that the king had a very important law. You do not approach the king unless you have been summoned. You do not walk up to the king unless he has invited you. If you do, you will be killed. He has one rare exception if the king decides to hold out his golden scepter. Now, we must think, surely this law would not apply to the king's queen. Surely. Actually, it did. Actually, it did. But then we think, surely he would stretch out the golden scepter to his wife, the queen. Esther has absolutely no confidence that the king will do that for her. Not even her husband. And now why is that? Look, what did you see what she said at the end of verse 11? 30 days have passed since I was called to the king. 30 days is a long time to be uncalled for by the king, especially as his queen. Now, at this point in the story, Esther and Xerxes have been married for five years. They've been married together for five years. And Esther doesn't have a lot of confidence that after five years of marriage, the king is still swooning over her. She has no com confidence. And not seeing the queen for 30 days doesn't seem to trouble Xerxes. And we can be sure of this, that he didn't spend those 30 days alone in bed. Mordecai knows the king's policy of entering uninvited, yet he urges her to risk it all for her people. He urges her. Now, Esther's scared. Esther is afraid here. She tries to explain, my hands are tied. More than that, there is a law that forbids me from doing this. I can't go against the law. And she understands that the situation is critical. But she can't help. And she doesn't want to get involved. I'm not the right person for it. She's afraid of death. She's afraid that this will cost her her life. And friends, this same fear is still very real today. If the last two years have taught us anything despite whether our world will admit it or not, we are absolutely scared to death of death. It's true. We are absolutely terrified of death. So no matter all of our outward talk, all of our creeds of faith, no matter all of our songs about heaven and all those things that we sing, the tragedy amongst Christians is that most of us are not ready to die. We're not prepared for death 
Does the thought of not living out an old age, living a long life, does that terrify you? Are you afraid of that, not making it? It was only a few, a few months ago that I received a phone call in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, and someone told me on the phone that a dear Christian brother of mine, only a young man, was rushed to hospital and he was taken to emergency surgery. Um, and I quickly text him, um, and then I received a text from him back saying, it's very, very serious. I've got an internal blockage. Um, they can't get blood to flow properly. And it's so serious, I might die tonight on the table. And I was shocked. And I rep- replied back, and then he sent me the following message back. I'm just about to head into theater. It's serious. I might die on the table, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. I trust in God whatever his will is. That was the last text I got from him that night. There was a young man who was ready to meet God. He was ready. In that moment, Esther has the law against her. She's losing favor with the king, it seems, and she's afraid to die. She's afraid of death. So we've seen a fearful people, a fearful leader. Thirdly, we see a fearless preacher. A fearless preacher. Esther sends all these reasons to Mordecai of why she can't do it. And now we'd expect Mordecai to realize Esther's point, And we'd expect him to be sympathetic. And we'd expect him to understand. It's so understandable. After all, she's been his adopted daughter. How much more so? And instead, the response that we get from Mordecai is like, the messages from one of the prophets in the Old Testament. It's incredible. He rebukes, he warns, he reminds, and he exhorts. Look at his rebuke, verses 12 to 13. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. The king has passed a law that all Jews will be killed. And don't think that your beauty will get you out of this. And don't think that the crown on your head will save your head. He confronts her and he says it's all vain hopes. And he fearlessly rebukes her self-preservation to save her life. And he's saying to her, as this massacre unfolds, are you going to keep your identity secret now? And as everyone is being killed, are you going to keep silent to save your own life? Is that what you're going to do? Mordecai's words are so hard. They're so tough. He's loading this great burden upon her shoulders and he's piling it on. He does not hold back. And why does he do this? Why does he do this to her? Understand, because the kingdom of God is not made up only of old saints who've been in the war for a long time. The kingdom of God is made up of boys and men, girls and women, and each of them have a duty to stand for the truth. And he does not hold back on her. That's what the kingdom of God is made up of. doesn't matter how young you are tonight. Mordecai rebukes her self-preservation. She wants to save her life. And friends, we are guilty of the same sin. We hold back, do we not, the gospel from people. We hold back the message of life. Why? Out of fear for our own well-being. To protect ourselves. And we can stay silent and watch people walk slowly, one step closer to the pit of hell, where they'll be destroyed forever. We will stay silent to protect ourselves and watch the many be destroyed. Out of fear, we need the fearless words of Mordecai more than ever. We do. We absolutely do. We're not just afraid of death. We're afraid of being mocked and ridiculed. So he rebukes her. Look how he reminds Esther of truth. Verse 14 For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. If Esther chooses to save her own life, Mordecai says, help and deliverance will come from another place. If you choose this. Now this is a big statement. There was no other Jew that was higher than Esther. 
There was no one else who had influence to save the Jews. There was no other kingdom that would stand up for Israel. Why would they? They were nothing. No one would go up to Xerxes to try and spare Israel. Why would they? And yet Mordecai believes God will deliver another way. It reminded me of that verse in Romans chapter 4 with Abraham. When things were completely impossible. What does it say about Abraham? Verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. What do we get in this passage? Against all hope, Mordecai in hope believed. What's he doing? He's demonstrating his faith in God and he's challenging Esther's faith. Where is it? And what else is Mordecai saying here? Don't miss it. If you keep silent, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. He is humbling her. He's saying, Esther, you are not indispensable. Do you see that? If you don't step up, God will use someone else. If you fail, God's plans won't. Doesn't that go against so much, so many things we hear about the book of Esther? It's about one woman and the fate of the Jews rests upon the shoulders of one woman. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Mordecai says, if you bail, if you deny your Lord in this and your people, God will bring deliverance from another place. His plans aren't stopped because of you. And he humbles the queen. Look at his terrifying warning in verse 14. If you keep silent, you and your father's family will perish. God will bring deliverance for the Jews, but you and your father's family will perish. He's pronouncing judgment upon her. He's like a prophet of old. If you deny the Lord, God will spare the Jews, but you and your family will not be spared. You will not be spared. This is a chilling warning. And again, it reminds us of what we see at the end of Revelation. At the end of Revelation, in chapter 1, we get a list put forward to us of all those who will be sent into the lake of fire. And it's all the categories of people that we would expect, right? Who's in the list? All murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. But then there's two groups of people that appear in the list that completely take us off guard. And the cowardly and the faithless, their portion will be in the lake of fire, which is the second death. Is this exactly not what Jesus told us? This kind of warning of being fearful and cowardly of our faith. What did Jesus say? Whoever is ashamed of me, when I return... I'll be ashamed of them before my Father and the angels. But whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father and the angels. The cowardly. And Mordecai gives the same terrifying warning. So he's saying, not only do you miss out on the opportunity to stand up for God and your people here, you've got this incredible ministry opportunity, but at the same time, you risk the judgment of God. You risk it. But as the best of preachers and even as the prophets of old, he doesn't leave her with this terrifying warning. He now exhorts her and encourages her in what she should do. And at the bigger picture, look at his exhortation. End of verse 14. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. The most famous verse in the whole book of Esther. It even appeared in one of the songs we sang tonight. You've called for such a time as this. Esther, he's saying, is this not the very reason God made you queen for today? Is this not your date with destiny right here? Now, what does this teach us about Mordecai? Maybe his faith was compromised before when he wouldn't return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. He would rather stay in the Persian Empire. Maybe his faith was compromised. But one thing we know for sure, he was no atheist. He was no atheist. Atheism is the denial of a divine plan. Atheism is the rejection of of any belief that we have divine appointments in this world. Atheism, Atheism denies any purpose to our lives. Atheism is all about the random. Everything is chance. We are cells, sophisticated bacteria. You are there because you are there. There's no divine appointments, just coincidences. And there is no purpose to any of it. 
Mordecai says to Esther, do you think that a young Jewish orphan like yourself rose to become the queen of the most powerful empire in the world for no reason? Is it not for today? For such a time as this, you here for such a time. This is your date. It's now. It seems obvious, right? We've been following the story. It seems obvious the answer that to answer that to that question, is it not for such a time as this? But perhaps the answer wasn't as obvious to Esther. For us it is. We look at this story knowing the end of it, right? And we come to the story with sight. We read it. Esther doesn't know the end, and she has to come to the story by faith. She's living this. And it's also not obvious to Esther for a number of reasons. Remember, the whole story of her even becoming queen has been controversial, hasn't it? Remember, she was summoned and had to join a long queue of virgins to spend one night and sleep with the king. And then she had to sleep with not just any man, not a religious man of faith, but with a pagan man. And it didn't end there. She had to marry a pagan king. And on top of all of that, she had strict, strict instructions not to tell anyone about her faith and identity. And for five years, she's kept her faith silent. And so Esther's got to weigh up this question. Am I really here for a purpose by God? Is he really with me? Hasn't she broken a bunch of commands? See, Esther, this is a difficult challenge. She has no burning bush experience like Moses. She hears no audible voice like Samuel. She gets no vision like Daniel, and she has no dreams like Joseph. Faith. So Mordecai confronts her and challenges her faith. So tonight we've seen a fearful people, a fearful leader, a fearless preacher, and now finally a fearless resolve. A fearless resolve. How will Esther Esther receive the sharp words that have been shot at her. Look at verses 15 to 17, and we'll just be really brief here. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. So she tells Mordecai, go gather all the Jews together and fast. Bring them all together and fast for me. Now in verse 3, we read of Israel already fasting the Jews. But that was a fasting of grief, of mourning and misery. Now we get a fasting with purpose. A fasting to seek the Lord. A fasting to see an outcome. To come together as the people of God again. A scattered people coming together To fast. It's a call to seek the Lord's help. Notice what else she says to Mordecai. I and my maids will fast as you do. Now isn't that incredible? I and my maids will also fast. Why is that incredible? Because the past five years, she has kept her identity and faith completely a secret. And now, the women closest to her, the maids, her colleagues... She shares with them who she is, and she invites them in to participate in the purposes of God, in seeking God. She brings them in. We're going to fast too. The secret's out. The secret is out of the bag. And, and this is why it's also interesting that she chooses to fast, and this is remarkable. From a worldly viewpoint, the decision to fast here is absolutely foolish. Absolutely foolish. She says, we're going to fast for three days. Fasting of that kind drastically disfigures one's body. Drastically. She's not going to look good. Now, she's going to have to, after three days, go into the presence of the king. She's not allowed to speak. The only thing she has going for her is her looks. And she's going to go into the king having fasted for three days. And if there's anything we've learned about King Xerxes, he makes every decision with his eyes and his testosterone. From a human standpoint, this is absolutely foolish. But now, 
the people are seeking God. Now Esther is turning to the Lord and seeking his help. So Esther calls the people to fasting before God and commits herself to it. And she closes the correspondence to Mordecai with the unforgettable words. End of verse 16. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. There it is. There it is. Mordecai rebuked her. He warned her. He challenged her. He reminded her. And he exhorted her. And here, the message hits its target. He fires his arrows, and one of them goes in between her armor, and it pierces her heart. It takes hold of her. And now she is shaped into the mold of Daniel. Daniel said, the Lord is able to save me from the mouths of the lions. And now she's molded into the shape of her brothers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Lord is able to save us from the fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow. Esther is there. If I perish, I perish. This is what we need today. A fresh work of the Holy Spirit. This kind of discipleship. With young people who don't treat their Christianity like another video game. They play it, they turn it off, they turn it on, they turn it off. With older Christians who finish off stronger than what they started, their zeal in their old age is brighter than when they first were converted. This is the kind of discipleship that we've been called to. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Esther is a living sacrifice. If I perish, I perish. Our Christianity needs this, a lukewarm faith that needs reviving because what we have is powerless and it's not worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not. Let me close here with a couple of points for us. Though this event here in Esther happened thousands of years ago, we find ourselves also in two positions. Like the Jews, who were absolutely helpless, the king had declared their destruction. The sentence was given. It was pronounced. And they're crying, and they're mourning, and they're weeping, and they're fasting. But friends, understand this. All the crying, all the weeping, all the fasting in the world will not be able to reverse the decision. What did they need? They needed a mediator. They needed someone to go to the king on their behalf. They needed someone to stand in the gap. And of course, it would cost that person maybe even their lives. And that's what they desperately needed. Esther's generation needed a mediator with Xerxes. This entire world needs a mediator between the God of the universe and themselves. We need one. Because he is declared in his word, the soul that sins shall surely die, and I will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And we are absolutely help us to do anything about it. We can fast, we can mourn, we can weep, we can say sorry, but we cannot go to the king. We need someone to stand in the gap. And 1 Timothy 2.5 says there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And he comes for this world, not just for the Jews, but for all people of all time. And he stands before the wrath of God. And he's punished for sinners. He stands in the gap and he dies as a substitute. So that all who believe in his death and resurrection will go from death to life and life eternal. Why is this story, the book of Esther, in our Bible? Rightfully, Jesus said, these things were written concerning me. She is a prototype of a deliverer and a mediator, and I am here. Believe on him. And secondly, 
we find ourselves not only in the position the Jews found themselves in, but we find ourselves in Esther's position. Now, none of us are ever going to face a crossroads like Esther. None of us. But we will have points where a decision must be made. Now, for some of you here tonight, you've been putting off Jesus for so long, and you think that your destiny is in your hands, that you've got all the time in the world, but you don't. And my friend who nearly died that night is a witness to that. He was only young. You must, you must make a decision for Christ. You must respond to him. You cannot put, it, put him off. Like Elijah said, choose this day whom you will serve. Stop putting the Lord off. Make it right. Now is the time. And for those of you who are Christians, we find ourselves in Esther's situation. Things are ramping up in our world. Things are getting very, very hot out there. And as Christians, it's time we stand. You must stand for Christ in your workplace. You must stand for Christ in your school. You must stand for Christ in your university. You must. And in your job, you cannot participate in wickedness. And if it costs you your job, it costs you your job. We stand upon the word of God and we do not move. We do not budge. You know, you hear Christians say things like, man, it's just such an awful time. I can't imagine having kids in a world like this now, raising kids in a time like this. Christian, for such a time as this, God has called us to disciple children. This world needs Christians. People on fire for the Lord. We are here now. This is where the Lord has us and we must stand for him. So all of us face it, the date with destiny. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? The Lord beckons and calls to each one of us. It will cost you. It will cost me. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your word. Uh, We believe that these scriptures are more than just a history book, but they are the words of the living God. Lord, we commit ourselves to you tonight and we thank you for our time together. And we recognize that there are no coincidences. So we are here, you have spoken, and I pray that we would respond to you. Oh God, use us as your people. And I pray that we would have that holy resolve to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, to serve you in this generation and to serve you for such a time as this. Lord, empower your people for such a difficult calling, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.